But because we've got strong inclinations and desires, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us. And He teaches us a very important lesson. Anywhere in the Quran, wherever God closes the door for haram, He opens the door for halal. He always shows us an alternative. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden illegal relationships, but then He has allowed marital relationships, He has allowed temporary relationships. In this verse of the Quran, He has also, in, in these verses of the Quran, He has also allowed a person sometimes to take a second when required or a third uh, partner as well. And there are some other uh, exceptions also made. And that's very important for us. As we're raising our children, whenever we tell them not to do something, we also teach them what to do. Whenever we tell them not to have haram fun, we also ought to teach them what are some of the halal fun that they can engage in as well. <coughs> then, because Allah is talking about the rights of women, it also talks about financial rights as well. Allah is taking this opportunity to talk about a very important financial principle. There are principles of finance in the Quran. The next verse is the most important verse that talks about the Islamic principle, one of the most important. In fact, this verse of the Quran is used in so many aspects of fiqh and so many chapters of fiqh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whenever there is a monetary transaction between two people, which is an obligatory transaction, meaning it's not a gift, one person is obligated to pass money to the other person, whenever such a transaction happens, it should be a productive transaction. Meaning what? Either it produces goods and brings them into society, or provides services and brings them into society. Otherwise, there can be no obligation to transfer funds from one person to another person. Like what? Like gambling. Gambling is haram. Why? Because of this principle. You're obligating one person to pass funds to another person, and the other person has not produced any goods, nor provided any services. For example, selling certain items which are najis is not allowed according to Islamic law. Why? Because one person is providing an item which has no value in society because it is najis. Obviously, the question comes, what if the najis item has value? Right? For example, as fertilizer. Or now that you can transfuse blood, what if it has value? There are marajas that we have allowed that we actually charge money, we buy and sell those items. But if they have no value in society, you cannot obligate another person to pay you for something that has no value in the society. What were to happen if we did not observe these rules of finance and fair play? You know, fair market. What were to happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنْفُسَكُمْ What does it mean? Do not kill your souls. It can have two meanings. The first meaning is, and do not kill each other. One. Second meaning, do not kill yourself. And the second meaning seems to be more apparent over here, especially when we look at the ahadith. Now you know that a couple of months ago in Canada, there was a case at the Supreme Court. And the question was, can a person assist another person who has a very debilitating disease or a debilitating condition in committing suicide or euthanasia. Obviously, the person himself, if he kills himself, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't charge him. But can somebody help them or not? The Supreme Court for long can say that, no, you cannot be helping another person to end their life, no matter how much they're suffering. But recently, the Supreme Court of Canada has actually allowed, in certain cases, for doctors to help others to end their lives when they are having extreme suffering. What does Islam say about this issue? Islam says no. There is a wisdom for why people suffer, <coughs> even if it is the most difficult suffering. And uh, life and death, we leave it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where do we get that from? We get that from this verse of the Quran and the hadith of the sixth Imam. Somebody comes to the sixth Imam, Imam Salih alayhi wa salatu wa salam. He asks the Imam, I'm suffering very much so. Am I allowed to end my life, to end this suffering? The Imam says, if you were to do that, you will end up in the fire of hell forever. Do not do that. 
If you're going through difficulties in life, God is aware of it and God is compassionate. Now, you look in those societies where there is a lot of corruption and where there is no fair market or there is no just market, you will see what happens in those societies. You should put those people who are very rich and you put those people who are very poor. And there is no middle class. And those who are very poor, they either become hopeless and they sometimes commit suicide and they kill themselves, or sometimes they may kill those who are rich and the rich may, or even those who aren't poor. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, maintain these rules of fair uh, uh, financial uh, laws. Now, sometimes it happens that somebody commits suicide because they were very much depressed and they were going through depression. And it was a significant depression. Question, that person, if they were to commit suicide, would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also place them in the fire of hell? Or not? The next verse of the Quran answers that. Allah says, وَمَنْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ عُدْوَانَ فَظُلْمًا Whoever does that, عُدْوَانَ out of animosity towards another person, unjustly killing him, وَظُلْمًا or killing himself, not because they had a medical condition such as depression, killing themselves because they weren't pleased with the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such a person he will go to the fire of hell forever. Then the next verse talks about committing of sins. It's a very interesting verse of the Quran. This verse of the Quran says, as long as you stay away from committing the major sins, God will forgive for you the minor sins. Sins are of two types. Major sins and minor sins. As long as a person stays away from committing major sins, on the day of judgment, God is not even going to ask him about his minor sins. God will automatically forgive the minor sins and place them in, him in paradise. Now obviously this raises a question. That means I don't have to worry about the minor sins. I just have to make sure I don't do the major sins and you know the minor sins Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is almost encouraging people <coughs> or is it encouraging people to commit minor sins yes taking minor sins lightly and and doing sin. them is is a major sin hmm. it is so there's a hadith where the imam says that to um, think of a sin as a minor sin is a major sin why there's another hadith that says that there are no minor sins when a person is persistent in committing them. So continuously committing minor sins is also a major sin. Thirdly, minor sins give us the audacity to commit major sins. A person continuously commits minor sins, eventually he's bound to commit a major sin as well. And therefore, no, this verse of the Quran does not encourage us to commit major sins. Then the next verse, the next two verses, now are closing a chapter of discussion. We have been talking about the rights of women, their rights of inheritance, and their role in society. The next two verses are closing that discussion. Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet, came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, you have asked the men to go for jihad, and you have given them such a great reward. And then, when, for example, they get inheritance, they get twice the inheritance of what women get. In many cases, Ya Rasulullah, you have given them more than you give to the women. So the, some of the objections that you hear in today's modern societies, even back then, they had these objections as well. <coughs> the difference being back then, when the Prophet of Allah told them something, they submitted to the saying of the Prophet of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse of the Quran. And Allah says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضُ Do not desire some of those things which Allah has given to some of you and has not given to some of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, for example, in some cases, twice the inheritance of a woman to a man and he has not given that. Do not be desiring of what God has not given you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not put the burden of providing for the family upon the women for the men, it was the same. Do not desire that for yourself. Allah has put that burden upon you. That is your burden. Allah has given you the burden of being jihad. But don't desire it. Or don't desire to run away from it. 
Now, why does Allah in Islam we don't have the concept of equality? All right. There's a concept of justice. There's a concept of similarity, but not equality. Men and women play different roles in society, and according to those roles, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given them their rights. Their rights are not the same, but their rights are fair. All right. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given them these roles based on their abilities and their capacities, and then given them the rights accordingly. So Allah says in the next part, Men have been given based on the capacity that God has given them. And women have also been given rights and roles based on the capacity and skills that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. What if I'm not happy? What if I'm not pleased with these rights and roles? Should I call for the laws of Islam to be changed? God says no. What's Allah amin? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God will give you. God will grant you what you want, inshaAllah. In Allah akana bi kulli shayin alima. God is aware of the laws and regulations that He has prescribed upon you. Walikulli ja'alna mawali mimma tarak al walidan wal akrabun. We have apportioned definite rights of inheritance and the people that who will inherit. And he's talking about also a particular form of inheritance. Now we've talked about people who are related to you and the fact that they inherit from you. Okay? Or people who are married inherit from each other as well. It's talking about another category of people who also inherit. It is very similar to life insurance that we have in this day and age. Okay? Back then, they had an agreement or a contract known as Dhamanul Jarirah. Two brothers or two people would sign a contract with each other that I am going to act as your brother. In your time of need, I'm going to help you. In your time of dire need, I'm going to support you. If you have ever any loans, I'm going to help you pay them. And they would agree that if one of them passed away and he had a debt, then the other one would help pay that debt. Or if he had some inheritance, then the other one would also inherit from him as well. This was present in Arabia when the Prophet of Allah came over there. Did Islam accept this contract or not? It did in some ways. It said that yes, these contracts are valid, but the person will only inherit if there is nobody else to inherit from them. If there is nobody else from the family members to inherit from this person, then the other individual with whom he signed a contract of brotherhood will then also inherit from him as well. And Allah talks about it in the last verse. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As you can see, it's almost 9:25, uh, which means that now when we have our programs after salat, it does run quite late. I do know that parents who have young children are not able to come out for it. We were thinking of maybe now moving and having the program before the Salat. So just consulting with you, do you think it's a good idea for us to have it before the Salat? Yes. yes. Okay. Just as we did last year. So whatever the time of Salat is, half an hour before that, we will start our program. Inshallah. Whenever there is a program at the masjid, we won't have a program. Whenever there is no program at the masjid, we're going to be having our Quran recitation. There's a question from upstairs. I was just wondering, what is, what's the difference between mentioning Islam? As we mentioned, that the most in this small. I can't hear properly, I'm sorry. If you can just come in front. What is the small sin being mentioned in the Quran? That's also another point I wanted to make. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us there are major sins and there are minor sins. Then there is the discussion, what is a major sin? Some of the ulama, based on the ahadith, they say a major sin is that sin for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised hellfire in the Quran. That you commit this sin, we will place you in the fire of hell. Then the ahadith do mention what are the sins for which God has promised hellfire? Some of the ahadith they have mentioned, for example, 10, some will mention 15, some will mention 20, so on and so forth. 
one of the things that's a problem is I can tell you which sin is a major sin. But if you ask me which sin is a minor sin, I don't know. Yes. Uh, right. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So, so the Quran, for example, says this is the definition of a major sin. Here are some of the major sins. But out of its wisdom, the Quran, nor the Hadith, never talk about minor sins. Meaning what? Meaning any sin that you commit, you think it's a minor sin, it could be a major sin. And therefore, that's another reason for why we want to stay away from committing minor sins. There are some things that God has hidden from us. One of them being minor sins. Which are the minor sins? God has not told us. Right? So for example, when it comes to acts of goodness, you don't know which act of goodness is going to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most. So what do you do? You perform all acts of goodness. Out of the community that we have, you don't know which member of the community is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do you do? Every member of the community you respect. The Knights of Qadr, you don't know which one of it is the Knight of Qadr. So what do you do? You try to respect the 19, 21, 23rd, maybe 27, maybe all the odd Knights, right? Similarly, you don't know which sin is a minor sin. So what? You try to stay away from all of the sins. Thank you. Asana. <coughs>